Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest uh, talk on CTSS. And this is a new talk. It's a strange title, CT of the Spleen uh, or Splenic Anomalies from Splenosis to poly Polysplenia. I'm not sure those are anomalies, but it's variations. And what I was going to look at, some of the potential pitfalls in diagnosis and how we work hard to avoid them. So let's look at some basic things about the spleen. Macroscopic anatomy. It's an intraperitoneal organ entirely surrounded by the peritoneum, which firmly attaches to the capsule of the spleen. The splenic hilum is usually directed anteromedially, and the splenic artery and vein enter the spleen in this region through the splenorenal ligament. It's what's considered a bare area of the spleen. The splenorenal and gastrosplenic ligaments are the two folds of perineum that hold the spleen in position. In terms of size, normal spleen weighs about 200 grams. It's about 12 centimeters in length, which is an important measurement, 3 to 4 centimeters in thickness, and about 7 centimeters in width. The one that people typically think about is the length. Over uh, 12 centimeters, you begin to think about splenomegaly, though you need to be careful because spleens have variable shapes, and perhaps if we were calculating volumes, that would be a better way of doing things. From a histological perspective, there's red and white pulp. The red pulp is a complex network of sinusoids and splenic cords. They function as a filter and blood flow regulator. The site of erythrocyte storage and macrophage proliferation and differentiation is the red pulp. The white pulp consists of lymphatic tissue, contains germinal centers. It's the site of the spleen's immunological and cytopoietic function. There's a marginal zone, an ill-defined interface between the red and white pulp. The transient heterogeneous pattern of contrast enhancement is thought to be related to the variable rate of blood flow through the wet and white, white pulp. And that's the thing I always speak about with you in the moray pattern of the spleen, which makes it seem on early phase imaging, perhaps the patient has a splenic lesion, and we recognize that's just a flow-related phenomena. Now, when we think about the normal variations in the spleen, and that's basically where I'm going to be putting this talk, we think about things, for example, like accessory spleens. Accessory spleens are um, found in about 10 to 20% of individuals, typically within the tail of the pancreas region and splenic hilum. One of the challenges with accessory spleens, and I'll go through this with examples, is because it's located often near the tail of the pancreas, it can abut the tail of the pancreas and simulate a neuroendocrine tumor. We also see, at times, splenic tissue being pushed into the pancreas, and also, even more difficult in those scenarios, uh, simulating a potential uh, neuroendocrine tumor. Accessory spleens can be the site of a relapse of hypersplenism and the splenectomy in patients with hematologic disorders. Um, splenosis is typically associated with trauma. It's ectopic splenic tissue caused by autotransplantation of splenic cells resulting from traumatic disruption of the splenic capsule via trauma or surgery. It could be either, but most cases of splenosis that we see are patients who have had traumatic splenectomies. Occasionally, it can occur with a splenectomy for other reasons, let's say a distal pancreatectomy and splenectomy, but that's a lot less frequent. Sometimes what happens is when you have the spleen removed, some of the accessory spleens that are small tend to enlarge, and that's why you see them better. Um, splenosis, typically compared to accessory spleens, they're more numerous, and the distribution is more widespread. We also talk about polysplenia, which is a real complex syndrome. It consists of situs ambiguous with features of left isomerism, which means bilateral left-sidedness. Multiple spleens in right or left upper quadrant. It can be single, it can be a lobulated spleen or a normal spleen, but the one typically is multiple spleens, as we'll show you. Often an anomalous position of abdominal viscera, a short pancreas, abnormal bowel rotation, and cardiovascular anomalies do occur. And the last one is particularly important. We also talk about a splenia, which is fairly uncommon. You have an absent spleen, situs ambiguous, multiple anomalies, including cardiovascular anomalies, uh, which may be more complex than those seen in polysplenia. 
you can see bowel malrotation and GU tract anomalies. So one thing to think about with polysplenia and asplenia, not just to think about the spleen, but to think about the fact there may be other things going on, particularly some of the comments with asplenia. Both asplenia and polysplenia have cardiac or cardiovascular issues. So again, it's an important diagnosis and maybe the first time someone is thinking about those possibilities. The last thing I'll mention, and I'll show you one example, is a wandering spleen. That's where the spleen migrates from its normal position in the left upper quadrant due to congenital or acquired laxity of the splenic suppensatory ligaments. And once you have this wandering spleen, it could easily twist on its pedicle, causing infarction and patients presenting with an acute abdomen. So something very important to consider. Now, when I look at the spleen, and one of the things I will go through with you is some of the pitfalls. I mentioned that it's not uncommon to see splenules by the tail of the pancreas, sometimes intrapancreatic, but you can imagine why they can be confused with neuroendocrine tumors, particularly arterial phase imaging. Um, we talk also about rotation of the uh, spleen in patients with left nephrectomy, simulating a recurrence in the left renal bed. So that's a potential problem if you're any good at CT, that's not going to be a problem because you'll recognize the spleen for what it is. We talk about splenic lesions in general and some of the confusion. Again, one challenge with splenic lesions, the majority are going to be benign, particularly incidental lesions, but we do see lymphoma, we do see metastatic melanoma, we see things from hamartomas to hemangiomas. Uh, all are possible splenic lesions. So the spleen is a challenging organ. Now, this accessory spleen is very, very popular because it has its own Wikipedia page with a lot of stuff written up. When you're in Wikipedia, you know you're going to be important. And listen to Wikipedia. An accessory spleen is a small nodule of splenic tissue found apart from the main body of the spleen. Accessory spleens are found in approximately 10% of the population and are typically around a centimeter in diameter. They may represent a lymph node or a small spleen. So just a really good description. So let's think about accessory spleens for a second. 16 to 20% of patients have them, particularly if you look carefully. They're usually two centimeters or less in size. A key component of accessory spleens, both in arterial and venous phase imaging, as well as late phase imaging, they typically enhance identical to the spleen both arterial and venous, which makes it easier for me to come up with a specific diagnosis. Again, we mentioned that accessory spleens can be a great mimicker and simulate pancreatic or renal or even adrenal pathology. Typically, accessory spleens appear on CT scans as well-marginated round masses under two centimeters in size. And when I say they enhance homogeneously, that means if you're looking at venous or later phase imaging, if you look at arterial phase imaging, they tend to have a moray pattern, very much like the uh, normal spleen. An accessory spleen can also be called a splenule or a splenuculus. It's a benign condition. Uh, so again, the key thing is not to confuse it with something of importance. Now here's a nice schematic of an accessory spleen. When you look at the spleen in coronal view, accessory spleens are more common on the inferior surface of the spleen, and that can be helpful at times if you're trying to distinguish between a neuroendocrine tumor and an accessory spleen. Some examples, about a three centimeter mass by the hilum. Let me go back there, I moved too fast. By the hilum of the spleen. You see the moray pattern looking like the spleen arterial, and on venous, it looks the same. Very classic, okay? You can have neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas. They'll be very bright, but they don't match the splenic enhancement, both arterially and venous. Another example, classic location, accessory spleen in the hilum of the spleen. The moray pattern is nicely seen on the arterial phase imaging. And here it is again as we go to the coronal view. Again, you're not going to confuse this with a node or a mass accessory spleen. Here it is nicely on the cinematic rendering where the texture mapping shows you nicely. The texture looking very much like the splenic texture. Here it is again. 
you can see the difference between the texture here and the normal pancreas, but it very much matches that moray pattern of the spleen. And here it is in one more cross section. So again, just very nice visualizations of the patient's accessory spleen. Another example, here's an accessory spleen sitting near the splenic hilum, brightness very similar to the spleen, about two centimeters in size. You can see it extends near the tail of the pancreas, but it's pretty clear in this case that it's near, but not arising from the pancreas. But again, the fact that it behaves like the spleen will prevent you from making a mistake. Another example here, very bright away from the pancreas. It comes closer on the later phase imaging on different positions, but it's clearly separate. It's clearly brighter. Uh, I would not be confusing this with a neuroendocrine tumor because it's near but separate. On the 3D, you can see how it comes by the undersurface of the spleen, looking very much like the schematic diagram I showed you a few moments ago. Now, accessory spleens can be single, typically, or they can be multiple. Here is a number of accessory spleens. Now, splenosis, usually, the obviously, you typically don't see the, the native spleen. Here you see the native spleen plus the multiple accessories. Um, typically, the spleens that are part of um, accessory spleens tend to be very similar in size, and they enhance very similarly. So here's just a few more images showing that. Sometimes it's very tricky. This patient had left up a quadrant pain. There's a mass about 6.2 centimeters right near the spleen. If you look, it enhances like the spleen, but it's a funny location. It's not by the hilum. It's really projected superiorly. So we went through a differential diagnosis. What could this be? We did think it was the spleen, but again, you could see with patient having symptoms, mainly because this is against the diaphragm. You could think of other vascular lesions perhaps, but this was an accessory spleen. Just a beautiful example. And you could see as you go from arterial to venous phase imaging, the lesion does wash out, but it stays brighter than the spleen and it looks a bit different than the native spleen. So this was a very, very good case and a very tricky case in many uh, issues. Uh, here's uh, just a nice example, same patient. You can see a little bit of a splenic artery. There's the lesion sitting above the spleen near the stomach but beneath the diaphragm and here it is from behind the spleen that's an accessory spleen again you can see the textural mapping looks the same uh, for both of these now because the patient was symptomatic they needed surgery anyway so it's not a problem but you can see why recognizing this can be somewhat difficult here's another case now most accessory spleens we talk about are near the splenic hilum centrally but others can be further away when things are further away from the hilum, that's where perhaps you don't think about accessory spleens or even splenules, and you can make a mistake thinking about a node or an oncology patient thinking about an implant. Sometimes these unusual accessory spleens are large. Here's one sitting down beneath the pancreas near the patient's left renal vein. Very, very vascular. Uh, intrapancreatic lesions are the result of splenic tissue buds failing to fuse during embryologic development and are not uncommon. In fact, they're quite common. Accessory splenic tissue is usually asymptomatic and found incidentally with the most common location splenic hilum. However, 10 to 15% are found in the pancreatic tail where they prove to be a diagnostic dilemma, which is why I focus with you on thinking about these lesions and thinking about the fact that they enhance identical to the spleen. If you have a tumor, neuroendocrine tumor, for example, of the tail of the pancreas, it'll enhance, but not the same way as the spleen, and surely not wash out the same way. Uh, intrapancreatic splenule, second most common location for accessory spleens, is in the tail of the pancreas, easily confused with neuroendocrine tumors, should never be greater than three sonomies medial from the pancreatic tail, should have identical enhancement to the spleen in all phases, and technetium-99 sulfur collard or heat-denatured red blood cell scans can be done if you're uncertain, and they have a better than a 90% accuracy, but every once in a while, they'll be falsely negative. Now, after traumatic splenic injury or splenectomy, small isolated spleens may develop. Uh, again, you can have implants almost anywhere 
And that gives you some of the pitfalls in this article by Lake. I don't know where he is now, but it was a great article he wrote when he was with us. I think he was a medical student. Um, and again, this whole idea about pitfalls, differentiation from hypervascular pancreatic lesions, differentiation from other tumors are all very, very important. Stephanie Quokia, when she was with us, wrote an article about these uh, potential pitfalls that usually the spleen, the accessory spleens are located along the dorsal surface of the pancreas, which can be helpful. The enhancement patterns we've spoken about, symmetric spleen to this accessory spleen um, on all phases of acquisition. Okay, that becomes very important. Although not statistically significant, several other findings are also helpful to differentiate intrapancreatic accessory spleens from neuroendocrine tubers. All of the uh, accessory uh, tumors or nodules were located at the tip within 3cm of the tip of the tip of the pancreas. So if something's more medial in the body, it's just not going to be uh, a accessory spleen simulating a lesion, but more likely a neuroendocrine tumor. So again, uh, if a lesion is seen more than several centimeters from the tip of the tail of the pancreas, it's less likely to be an accessory spleen, but more likely to be a neuroendocrine tumor. So that can prove helpful. And this article, interestingly, I say it's impressed, published only about six years ago, so I need to fix that slide, which I thought I fixed. But again, location enhancement are the key findings that we use for differential diagnosis, okay? Now, in cases where you're not sure, as I mentioned, which is rare, we're always sure, and things usually are easy to make the diagnosis. You can always get tagged red blood cell studies, heat damage red blood cell, or, uh, or, or MRI, but typically the classic is the uh, technesium study. So again, that can be very helpful for you to make the right no diagnosis. Now, in terms of um, incidental pancreatic lesions, the uh, intrapancreatic accessory spleen is just one of them that you need to be aware of. We are always very careful about this. We've seen patients referred in for neuroendocrine tumor resection, and you realize what you're dealing with. So it's an important diagnosis and an important diagnostic dilemma. Just some comments how frequently 10 of 303 patients who underwent a distal pancreatectomy had a final path of intrapancreatic accessory spleen. So that means 10 patients. Now that's only 3%, but it's 3% more that you would have liked to make the diagnosis correctly. So again, very important diagnosis. And in our experience, patients are often um, sent to Hopkins for a splenic neuroendocrine tumor, which we see a lot of, but then every once in a while, you recognize you're dealing with a pseudolesion. That is a spleen accessory simulating a neuroendocrine tumor. And this article by Ba, they had a whole uh, flowchart. I'm not a big flowchart fan. Most of the time, I think you can make the diagnosis on CT by following my rules. But if you can't make the diagnosis, a technesium study can be done and can prove very helpful. Okay, now let's stop at this point. I have a lot more to go over with you and I don't want to wear you out on part one. So let's stop right here. Let's come back to part two and discuss many of the other things in terms of uh, uh, these important splenic variations. Be right back. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.